I can still remember the first time that I saw Quake in action. I was walking through a shopping center with my dad. We walked past a gaming store and there in the front window was an old CRT monitor with that iconic demo of E1M3 that I think everyone who's played Quake is now familiar with. Since then, Quake's gone on to become the stuff of legends and one of the most important first-person shooters of all time. Remembered for its fast-paced gameplay, vivid art style, along with some unique marketing. It'd be hard to find someone who hasn't at least played one of the games in the series, and with it still getting mod support and new content even now in 2021, not to mention the release of Quake Champions a few years back, it's something that's definitely stood the test of time, to the point that it's now 25 years old. I mean, even Joe Rogan goes on about how good this thing is, and that's someone right there who's known for nothing but his high quality takes. It's a game that I first covered years ago, back when my channel was even crappier than it is now. Quake is hard. Fucking hard. But it's not every day that one of your favorite games turns a quarter century old, so I thought it would be worth going back and taking a look at this thing one more time. It's kind of hard to talk about this thing considering it's been covered to death, but still, grab that super shotgun and armor pickup, and let's hop into the slip gate one more time to give this thing another look. Right, so it's no secret anymore, but originally Quake was supposed to be a third person game with a focus on melee combat. Thankfully though, id Software had the good sense to put that idea on hold and turn it into a first person shooter instead. And John Romero would take that concept and bring it to life with Daikatana a few years later, and yeah, we all know how that turned out. Son of a gun! Much like Doom, Quake also unleashed a brand spanking new engine on the gaming world, and although it's technically called the id Tech 2 engine, it's always more commonly just referred to as the Quake engine. It's kind of funny saying it now, but if you had a beefy rig, you might have been able to run this thing at a whopping 1024 by 768 resolution. That's if you don't mind running the risk of burning your house down with an overheated GPU. It burns, it burns, burns, oh yeah man, this thing pushed PC bills to their absolute limits back then, using up 75 megabytes of hard drive space, requiring a Pentium processor, 16 megabytes of RAM and a Voodoo graphics card. Oh! The engine also got used later on down the track with Hexen 2, the total conversion Malice, which is criminally underrated. Consider it done. And even as recent as 2021 with Wrath E on a Ruin, which is still in development by 3D Realms. Despite it not actually having anything to do with Doom specifically, Quake does have some pretty basic similarities. Instead of opening a portal to hell, this time it's opening a bunch of slip gates, which were gateways to alternate dimensions. And this time, instead of it being demons on the other end, it was Lovecraftian monsters, ancient gods, and anime fans. The first level of each chapter takes place in some kind of military base not too dissimilar to the UAC environments in some of Doom's earlier episodes, with again human enemies that are under this evil influence. <laughs> Then after that, the levels were much more medieval and fantasy-like. About the only downside is that the modeling for all of the weapons and the enemies has kind of been done within the limitations of the engine itself. Whereas in other sprite-based games like Doom, Hexen, and even later games like Duke Nukem 3D and Blood, they were able to be a lot more artistic with the sprite work. But in terms of how the whole thing plays, it still stacks up with Doom. You've even got that same avatar down the bottom of the screen, which is gonna change depending on how much damage you take. Like Doom, Quake's also got some really unique enemies which have really gone on to become some of the most iconic in the entire genre, and again, are just instantly identifiable in-game. You've got the basic grunt enemies, you've got the fiends, through to the ogres with that very recognizable bouncing grenade sound effect. Not to mention the goddamn shamblers. You can also see the influence from the game's originally planned melee focus with enemies like the Death Knights as well. The goal in Quake is kind of simple. You play through four different episodes as opposed to the three in Doom, collect four different runes, and then unlock a portal to the dimension of the creature responsible for this whole invasion. You're playing as an unnamed Marine who'd later get the name Ranger in Quake 3, and he's the poor guy who has to deal with all of these nasty monsters coming out of these slipgates. Yeah, it all kind of sounds very similar to a certain Marine at a certain UAC base, doesn't it? Also, Ranger's another Marine who doesn't talk that much outside of just making various grunts and moans mostly when he jumps or takes damage. And I also thought that was pretty gnarly how when you're killed, you can often hear him gurgling his own blood. 
come back to the surface after swimming around for a bit and you'd hear him gasping for air <coughs> and fall into acid or lava and he'd scream a lot differently to just taking generic damage from one of the main enemies. <coughs> And if you took a really bad fall, you'd even hear his bones crunching as he landed. Which is the sound that I hear almost daily now as I wake up in the morning and make that arduous trek downstairs to the kitchen for a cup of coffee. <coughs> Though I do have to say that I thought it was a bit of a weird stylistic choice for them to let Jeremy Clarkson voice some of his lines. Oh for God's sake! Motherfucker! Although there was this overarching plot about Ranger having to defeat this ancient god, this was still peak old school FPS, where the story is about as important as how many friends you have on Facebook. All you need to know is that Ranger's business is killing and business is booming. Quake had some pretty basic but fundamental improvements to the movement controls. I mean, for starters, you can now jump along with going underwater and swimming, often through bodies of water that resemble raw sewage. They didn't wait long to show all of this stuff off either. I mean, the first room of the first level has a platform you can jump across to get that armor pickup. Later on, there's a bridge, and if you fall off into the water, you can then swim through to another secret area. It was also, I think, one of the earliest games to implement proper mouse aim, and I still remember trying to get used to this back in the day. I mean, back then, though, I was still using the directional buttons instead of the W, A, S, and D keys. There's few games that have such a solid and well-rounded lineup of weapons, and when you boil the whole thing down, these guns are again just a natural evolution from what we got in Doom. Quake's weapons are functional and utilitarian. They're hardworking, they're honest, and they never let you down, unlike a certain stepfather. The shotgun is basically a pistol, though, I mean, it's called a shotgun, but that's a bit of a misnomer. <laughs> It has the same kind of firing rate that a pistol has, and it also does bugger all damage. About the only thing it's good for is shooting some of the weaker enemies and shooting at street signs. But it can still be useful later on because it is pretty accurate at longer ranges. The super shotgun is the real shotgun here, and this is useful in most close to medium range encounters. It's got a decent firing rate, it does decent damage, and Ranger is such a badass that he's somehow able to reload this thing within the blink of an eye. <laughs> Not to mention, it takes up the third weapon slots, as all good shotguns should. Instead of a chain gun, you've got two nail guns, and these nail guns cause some serious bodily harm to whatever you're aiming at, and like the shotgun, you've got a normal and a super variant. The normal nail gun's good against weaker enemies, mostly for ammo conservation, and then the super nail gun is useful for pretty much everything. About the only downside is just how quickly you burn through your remaining ammo supply. But sweet Christmas, the sound this thing makes when firing, Look, there's few sound effects in shooting games that capture that feeling of just unleashing hell on your enemies. The rocket launcher again makes an appearance, though this thing makes Doom's rocket launcher look like a nerf gun in comparison. The rocket launcher in Quake, it's more like a force of nature. It's like an artillery cannon. And it also helped to popularize that mechanic of rocket jumping. The grenade launcher is like an alternate version that shoots in an arc instead of a straight line. And we're also going to have to deal with the fact that the ogres, one of the most abundant enemies in the game, are also fond of using this weapon as well. Oh shit, I'm sorry. Getting used to the trajectory of firing this weapon is one of the many life skills I've had to learn over the years, along with reverse parking, poaching eggs, and finger blasting your mum. And you know what, if you don't end a quake session without hearing that noise of those grenades bouncing around in your head for the next few hours, well, then you probably didn't play for long enough. In lieu of any kind of BFG weapon, the next best thing is the lightning gun that lets you fire out a constant stream of lightning like it's a goddamn laser pointer. In a really neat attention to detail, shooting this thing when you're underwater is also going to actually kill you, which for a small kid was about the best PSA you'd ever need to teach you to keep electrical appliances away from pools of water. And yeah, how could I almost forget the most important weapon of all, the axe? Now to be honest, I've kind of never seen the purpose of this thing, outside of it just being there to fill the melee slot. I just can't think of any instance when it's all that useful, outside of maybe combining it with the quad damage, but that's about it. Yeah, combine any of these weapons with that quad damage power up, which does exactly what it sounds like, and then every enemy left on the level is going to definitely have a really crappy day. And yeah, has there ever been a simpler yet more useful power up in all of gaming? There's been double damage power ups, but someone that did software just thought, you know what, double damage just doesn't do it for me. Triple damage? Nah son, how about quad damage? 
And thus, one of the most overpowered power-ups of all time was created. And that was a good day. Gotcha, bitch! Luckily too, you won't be without your fair share of monsters to kill here. In fact, it's still kind of startling just how ferociously enemies are going to come after you in this game. It's like they go from 0 to 60 as soon as you're in their line of sight. You rarely see enemy behavior in a game that has conveyed the notion of something hating the player with such passion and dedication. The Fiends, for instance, have to be some of the most aggressive fuckers in any shooting game I've ever played. Enemies being fully 3D modeled also made them seem a lot more threatening, combined too with some really impressive animations. And there was just nothing anywhere near this kind of ferocity in Doom 1 or Doom 2. I still think it's a neat attention to detail as well, how you can knock those ogres off their feet, causing them to have to slowly pull themselves back up. You gotta say too that these guys were a pretty big pain in the ass at the time. I mean, an enemy that could launch grenades from a distance, but then also use his chainsaw at close range. That's what they call playing the field. The grunts and the rottweilers just make for good fodder, and it's still really fun just mowing down droves of these things with the super shotgun or the nail gun. Zombies could only be killed by blowing them up with either the rocket launcher or the grenade launcher. And the shambler takes only half damage from explosions as well. And just to make sure you never get too comfortable, they throw the flying scrags at you as well. Floating, torso, snake looking things that shoot poison at you. So it's a pretty varied roster of hazards that still offers up some challenging encounters, even to this day. Quake also threw a heap of traps at the player too. Now, these were blatantly obvious if you played the game with your eyes open, but again, it's just another cool way in which they made this world seem so threatening and imposing. I mean, even the environment itself is trying to kill you. But then the level items have been added to the maps in a way that it always seems that whenever you need that box of nails or that next med kit, that it just so happens you find one around the next corner waiting for you. This is still a game that's going to kick the shit out of you though, make no mistake. And it's definitely earned its stripes as a hardcore old school shooter. All of the four episodes have been worked on by different members of its software, which helps in making them all feel unique and separate. You've got Romero, who's done most of the human installation levels, the ones that house one of the four slip gates, which then take you to each dimension. Along with most of episode two, which has a bit of a medieval theme that we'd see coming back in full force in Daikatana's third episode. <laughs> Tim Willett's worked mostly on episode 1, along with American McGee, and this episode I think having some of the best level design in the entire game. The Necropolis, for instance, is more like a tech demo showreel of all the cool shit that the Quake engine could pull off. It's the first time you see the Shamblub. It also just had some really cleverly designed obstacles for the player to overcome, and there's probably a reason why this is the level they show off on that demo when you first load up the game. Plus, this whole first episode just has some really cool sounding levels. I mean, like the Grizzly Grotto and the Castle of the Damned. And as a rule of thumb, if the level sounds like it'd make a good band name, well, then you know you're in for a good time. But that's not to say that the other episodes aren't any good. American McGee worked on a lot of episode 3, with episode 4 almost being entirely created by Randy Peterson, who I hope is well. It's just, I really do think that episode 4 is kind of the weakest of the bunch. Some of the levels here just aren't that good, and a lot of them have very minimal lighting, so you can barely see what's going on. And it's not a matter of it being moody or atmospheric, it just kind of feels like it lacks light sources. Apparently this episode was comprised of levels that they didn't know where else to put, so they all just kind of wound up in here. Not to mention they're full of the toughest enemies in the game. The fiends, the boars, the shamblers, and the spawns. The spawns are the most annoying enemies in the game by long shot. I mean, just by design, they're terrible in concept. Any enemy that attacks you at close range and happens to explode when it dies, I mean, it's just dumb. And can you believe that this guy right here even wanted to include them from the first episode and onwards? Yeah, don't fall for that wholesome smile. Underneath those gorgeous eyes lies the heart of a sadistic, tyrannical warlord. Back to the fourth episode though, in Sandy's defense, he is pretty generous with those pentagrams of protection and quad damage, so you're not completely outmatched. Visually, there is some standouts too, like this one inside that demonic church is actually a real highlight. But I just don't know what it is with its software in these fourth episodes. Thy Flesh Consumed was the fourth episode in Ultimate Doom, and yeah, we all know how that turned out as well. Still though, the levels look better, they sound better, they're tougher and more complex, and the new enemies are more aggressive and advanced, so overall it's a bit of a perfect evolution. There's also so many memorable and iconic elements to Quake's sound design as well, which really still linger in the back of my head. Like the sound you make when teleporting. Mm. The sound you make when picking up armor. 
and I already kind of mentioned it before, but the sound of grenades bouncing across the floor. I mean, even just the sound of Ranger grunting over and over each time you jump, it's got to be some of the most memorable sound effects of all time. <laughs> Quake's also got a really unique soundtrack as well, composed by some dude called Trent Reznor, I think it is, from a little indie band called Nine Inch Nails that no one's ever heard of. And you compare the stuff that he did here in Quake to what Sonic Mayhem would eventually do in Quake 2 and Quake 3, and it definitely makes this game stand out from the rest of them in some pretty big ways. Sonic Mayhem's work in those other games felt more like it was accompanying the tone and the mood, whereas Trent's stuff here in Quake feels more like it's creating the tone and the mood. It's a soundscape versus a soundtrack, if that makes sense. few soundtracks capture that feeling of crossing between dimensions and dealing with nightmarish Lovecraftian horrors with industrial weaponry as well as this one does. And I think it's a real bold choice too how they decided to go with Trent, as opposed to originally working alongside popular Australian rock band Men at Work. I think their undisputed masterpiece is Land Down Under, a song so catchy that most people probably don't even listen to the lyrics, but they should. Even just the ambient noises when nothing is happening does a great job of capturing the eerie mood and the tone, along with those constantly moving skyboxes, which always kind of reminded me of the opening scene in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Too bad you will die. Ah! <laughs> So it all starts to make sense how Quake is considered such a classic, and has gone on to influence countless shooting games to come. I mean, just off the top of my head, you've got the amazing map packs like Arcane Dimensions, which redefines the limitations of the Quake engine when it's been put into the hands of absolute chads. Machine Games, the guys who rebooted the Wolfenstein series, also did their own brand new episode, which honestly feels like something designed way back in 1997, but in a good way. I'm also a huge fan of the Slayer's Testament mod, a mod which does its best to incorporate gameplay mechanics from Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal into the Quake engine, and that's something it mostly achieves. As was the style at the time, we also got two expansion packs, Scourge of Armagon followed by Dissolution of Eternity, and gotta say that both of these are pretty damn good. Scourge was developed by Hypnotic Software, who would eventually go on to change their name to Ritual Entertainment, and then create the Sin games along with Heavy Metal Fact 2. Groovy. Time to kick some butt. Two games both featuring a kinky brunette who likes to dress up in tight clothing. Yeah, my kind of game. Save it for someone who cares, winch. Scourge of Armagon is kind of like a mini sequel to Quake, where a lesser being to shove Niggurath named Armagon is trying to take control of what remains of his forces, and old mate Ranger has to take him down. This is broken up into three episodes instead of Quake's original four, though these are also a lot shorter. You've got three new enemies as well. You've got these robotic scorpions that kind of give me PTSD thinking about the arachnoids in Serious Sam. There's the gremlins, which are like little rat dog things that hop around and make a sound like a hyena with a speech impediment. As well as Armagon himself, the final boss who bears a lot of similarities to the Macron in Quake 2. There's even a bunch of new weapons. You've got the laser cannon, which is kind of like Doom's plasma rifle, even using the same energy as the lightning gun. The grenade launcher now comes in a proximity mode, which is honestly kind of useless. And you'll even get Thor's hammer at one point, which again uses the same ammo as the lightning gun, which is kind of clever. The first episode has you moving through all of these military bases and installations, similar to the first levels of each of Quake's episodes, which I always thought were the most fun out of the bunch. The real headline though is that in some of these levels you get a few times where you get to spawn in your very own pet shambler, which follows you around for the entire level and even helps you out. 
some kids grow up wanting a dog, a cat, or maybe a goldfish, but I take a pet shambler over those any day of the goddamn week. <laughs> Bitch. Dissolution of Eternity, on the other hand, was developed by Rogue Entertainment. Now that's a name which might not sound too familiar, but these guys created Strife in 1996, which was a pretty awesome first-person shooter that also happened to run on the Doom engine. Not to mention, like id Software and Ritual Entertainment, these guys were located in Texas. I mean, I feel like you could have thrown a tennis ball across the room back then and still hit someone who was involved in FPS development, along with maybe hitting Car Max Ferrari. Instead of three episodes though, this time there's only two, and instead of adding in new weapons, it's instead got alternate ammo types and fire modes for a few of the original ones. So for the nail gun and the super nail gun, you've now got lava nails, which deal more damage. The grenade launcher now shoots out in clusters, and the lightning gun fires off a single ball of plasma, kind of like a weaker ghetto version of the BFG. But the real showstopper here is the multi-rocket mode for the rocket launcher, which fires three rockets at once instead of one. This means if you're accurate enough, you can take out Death Knights and Ogres in a single hit. And this thing was just fucking awesome. Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! They've also added in a new enemy type called the Wraths, which are like basically floating vores that shoot out a faster but weaker projectile. The only other new enemy that's worth mentioning are these floating swords that attack you. Yeah, floating swords. Now look, in actuality, it's supposed to be an invisible ghost, but that's still not all that creative. Invisible enemies are a bit of a lame justification for someone not being bothered to create something in the first place. I've also kind of thought too that this expansion pack shares a lot of similarities with Hexen 2. And I like to think in my own head canon that Ranger somehow managed to find a slipgate that's taken him to the same dimension as the Serpent Riders. There's a lot of similar looking Roman, Egyptian, and Aztec environments, and at one point there's a reference to the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which were the four main bosses in Hexen 2. And even the Guardians you fight at the end of some of these levels look a lot like the Egyptian enemies from Hexen 2. Thankfully though, in this expansion pack, you're not going to be wandering around like a headless chicken with dementia trying to figure out where to go next, so yeah, it's got that going for it. It is definitely unique artistically though, and that level where you're going through that Aztec temple avoiding traps like your Indiana Jones is a definite highlight. And I was really surprised at how good this one still looks. It's a great example, man, of how a good art style and clever architecture really never ages. It is kind of ruined by the end boss fight though, which is so terribly designed I'm convinced it was a level that was outsourced to a blind person who has no idea how to design levels. You've got a fight against a dragon that's flying around the room, but the arena itself has all these precarious walkways above lava. There's an anti-gravity pickup at the start, which I have to assume has just been put there to troll the player. Because floating around like you're on the moon against an enemy that fires near unavoidable projectiles is a fucking terrible idea. It's a bit of a shame it had to end like this, but at least the rest of the expansion is pretty fun. Now, throughout the years, Quake's had more versions and source ports and the amount of times your mum's given her phone number away at the local truck stop. You could probably fill an entire video talking about all of these. In fact, shit, I think someone already did. One of the more interesting ones, I think, though, is the version they made for the Nintendo 64, which got a similar treatment to Doom 64. Mostly in the way that it completely changed the lighting around and adds in new music by Aubrey Hodges, who, funnily enough, also did the soundtrack for Doom 64. And it's a really cool example of how something as simple as the lighting and the music on what's otherwise a pretty much unchanged game for the most part, ends up having a profound effect on the tone and atmosphere for the game on the whole. The sequels was where it really started to get interesting, and there's more bad takes online about Quake 2 and Quake 4 than there were multiplayer servers for Quake 3. I do think Quake 2 is a game that people needlessly shit on, same thing with Quake 4. And most of the time it seems people only really hate on Quake 2 because it's not Quake 1, and then they hate on Quake 4 because it's not Quake 3. These are also the same group of people who say that Doom 3 is a good game, but just not a good Doom game, whatever the hell that means. I don't think either of these games are bad, in fact I kind of like Quake 2 and Quake 4. Quake 2 was a game like Half-Life and Unreal that helped popularize environmental storytelling and that overarching level design into shooters. It helped to bring an end to the level-to-level -level format of older shooters like Doom and Quake, and started to create these tangible worlds for the player to explore. It was less about finding the exit level button and more about going on a journey from beginning to end. 
And yes, that's something that even Quake 2 pulled off pretty damn well. Starting off at a Strog defense based way of course, and then ending with a showdown against the Strog leader inside his palace. Quake 4 did something even different. It was a much more cinematic military shooter with a focus on team-based gameplay and character development. That's where you come in, Kane. I mean, people who shit on this thing forget that it has one of the best body horror sequences in any video game, where your character's stuck on a conveyor belt and ends up having all these limbs removed. I mean, you can't develop much more as a character than having your legs cut off and being turned into a half-alien robot man. <laughs> It does have some awful sections though, and it also doesn't give you enough ammo at times, but focusing on the smaller details like that is really overlooking some of the game's greater aspects, like its stellar dynamic lighting and environment design, the way that it updates a lot of Quake's iconic arsenal, and also some of its more challenging combat sequences later in the campaign. I guess my whole point is, stop hating on Quake 2 and 4. I mean, if we should be hating on any game in the series, it should be Quake 3. I mean, that game's the reason we still haven't had a single-player reboot. Because id Software and Saber Interactive spent all that time working on a new multiplayer game instead. With the recent success of Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, Quake is really a series that's ripe for a reboot or a remake. The shooter genre is at a bit of an all-time high, mostly due to the popularity of all of these so-called throwback shooters. That style of shooting and gameplay that Quake originally helped popularize is now becoming the norm again, and the support would definitely be there for someone to go back and take a spin at trying to reinvent it for a new audience. Maybe even two people. Two guys from Texas with dark hair, warm eyes, and wholesome smiles. In the meantime though, hook yourself up with a source port and pay homage to one of gaming's baddest motherfuckers. Happy birthday, Quake.